Uh, and, and so we see a policy that was pursued in the 50s and in the 60s by administration after administration that sought actively to understand and in the full sense engage the threats uh, and challenges that America faced. But that's because, you see, I think up until a certain point in our history, the elites who necessarily, of course, are represented in the management of these policies were in fact committed to the defense of America's sovereignty, of America's independent existence, and of America's free way of life. Uh, I believe that the problems we are now encountering uh, in terms of a total lack of strategic vision arise at the end of the day from the lack of commitment, a pervasive, a general lack of commitment on the part of America's policy-shaping elites to the independence of this country, to the survival of its free institutions, to, if I can put it this way, the ideological dimensions of what is inevitably an ideological struggle in the world. Many of these elites now have contempt for anything that cannot be measured in dollars and cents, even as we watch ourselves being pummeled and defeated every day by forces in the world whose efficacy against us cannot be measured in dollars and cents because it arises from what, what even these folks have to recognize as a deep and fanatical ideological commitment that sometimes takes on a religious guise, as in the case of the Iranian regime, and sometimes acts and operates uh, under the guise of a more materialistic and uh, uh, ideological commitment that arises from Marxism, left-wing ideology, whatever it may be. Is it, do you think, possible for uh, a people seeking to survive in the context of a world in which forces coming against us achieve their cohesion through a deep commitment to the ideological premises that ultimately animate them, is it possible for us to defeat them without ourselves? without ourselves caring for the ideas, the principles, the motivating understanding of justice and right that ought to unite us in confident defense of our way of life? See, I don't think it is possible. I think the fact that for the last, going on 20 years now, we have been trying to operate as if it is, uh, is what has given rise to serious flaws that ultimately have a very practical result because they lead to a deficiency in strategic understanding. Stra strategy must always be guided in the end of the day, at the end of the day by a strong commitment to the defense of something. If you cannot define it, if you cannot articulate it, if at the end of the day you are not truly committed to it, then your strategic thinking fails and so does your defense. I, I sadly think we are watching the culmination of this process in the Obama administration. Now, I'm not going to stand up here for reasons of, of various levels of uh, rationality and prudence and, and simply uh, uh, suggest that one of the problems we face in America today is that those who are presently charged with the conduct of our foreign policy may be as hostile to the survival of our country as our more overt enemies. I'm not going to say that. What I am going to say is that if I go down the list of actions, policies, statements, whether they are, are actions that involve the articulation of policy, actions that involve how we have dealt with our allies in Europe and elsewhere, actions that involve how we have tried to portray and understand our own role in the world, actions that involve how we portray and understand our own worth as a nation, as a society. If I go down each and every one of these areas, from the articulation to the implementation, from even the, the decisions that have been taken about our nuclear force structure and other things, I watch people coming to conclusions and taking actions if they were, in fact, part of the forces hostile to our way of life seeking to destroy us. They couldn't more effectively cooperate with those forces than they are now cooperating. I think the question of whether they engage in appeasement or engagement or any of these other things is irrelevant. The question is, do the actual consequences of the steps they take 
Have those consequences been hurtful or helpful, damaging or not damaging, to the interest and survival of our country? And I think to get some answers to that, one simply has to look at what is going on in the world, what has happened to our prestige, as evidenced by the last G20 meeting. I don't believe I've ever seen such a spectacle of repudiation of American leadership as we saw there. Our economic situation, I don't believe we have ever as a nation been as close to being enslaved by our indebtedness to foreign powers, not even when this country was new and entirely dependent for the resources that we used to fight the revolution on the Dutch and the French and others. Have we ever experienced the degree of subservience we now experience on account of fiscal irresponsibility that is enslaving us to those who can only be described as, as questionably friendly to our survival as a people. Uh, and, and you go down the list and you find at the end of it that, sad to say, there is even an assault underway, could be just on the basis of ideological stupefaction. Not quite the right word, stupefaction. I was thinking about this on the way here. But because stupefaction su suggests that you're simply being uh, drugged or lulled into a state of, uh, of oblivion. And I think it, we need a word that would be like stupidify, but we don't have it, you see. To render stupid, uh, at the very least, whether they are hostile or not, the fervent, deep, ideological commitments of those who presently have their hands on the reins of our policy in these areas has rendered them stupid when it comes to defending the interest, vital, key, critical, survival interests of the American people, both physically and institutionally. Uh, final question. Well, I, I think that it, it is a famous maxim even of our constitutional law, that our constitution, that our society, uh, that the terms on which we relate to one another do not constitute a suicide pact. Meaning to say that some of us don't have to stand silently and idly by while others of us push our nation over the cliff that will lead to its ultimate destruction. Uh, I would have to join uh, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman in the hope that the resurgence of the public's participation and interest in what our elites have been doing overall with our policy domestically, but also in terms of our foreign policy that we saw in the recent election, I would hope it might begin to have an effect that will rouse people in every quarter to deal with issues, whether they are issues like the lack of an effective policy to thwart the imperialistic and fanatical ambitions of the Iranian regime, or a consistent application and pursuit of policy that are fundamentally weakening us in strategic terms, in moral terms, in economic terms that spell disaster for our future, I would hope that that resurgence will include a willingness to stand up and vocally demand a reversal of these self-defeating and suicidal policies, whatever silly labels are applied to them by those who pursue them. Um, and, and I'd have to just as a little bit of an aside suggest that when I say that the, the policy term engagement is a silly label, I, I know wherever I speak because I help to develop that label. Uh, and the understanding that underlies it uh, when we were pursuing a policy of engagement towards South Africa during the Reagan years. Uh, and I can uh, testify from, from that experience that the present abuse of the term has nothing whatsoever to do with the kind of intelligent strategic thinking that can in fact defend the interests of this country. This must come to a halt. I think one first step in doing so is to begin to demand an activist policy that seeks to thwart the intentions of the Iranian regime and work with those forces within Iran uh, that are friendlier to the aspirations of liberty and the existence of institutions 
that in fact respect the basic political and other rights of human beings. The absence of such a policy during the Bush years and now emphatically during the Obama years when they send birthday greetings to these tyrants, I, I, I think it has to be stopped. Final point, obviously the real reversal of all of this is unlikely to take place under present political arrangements. Uh, but I would leave you with one question for thought. If it is in fact the case, as I would certainly suggest, that this lack of strategic vision has plagued American policy under a Republican-led administration and now in a deeply aggravated and intensified way uh, under the ideologically stupidified administration of Barack Obama, do we really think that either of these two political vehicles represents an approach that will help our way of life and our institutions and our liberty to survive? I think we need seriously to think through this deficiency and begin to understand that at the end of the day, it is not Republicans or Democrats or anyone who thinks in the narrow, partisan, cynically ambitious way characteristic of our present party system that will have any hope of saving this country. That can only come from the decent heart of its people, thinking not about the parties, but only about the survival of this country and the hope it is supposed to represent in the world. God, God bless you, Alan. And I just wanted everybody to know that we're not discriminating in terms of questions. We have two hours and we had eight speakers here. So that's why we're moving it along. And Alan's been very comprehensive in what you've had to say. If anyone has a question quickly, it can be asked, but we have to move on because we have many other speakers. Thank you very much. Alan, great speech. Love you. Thank you.